Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as Phil said, I come from a ministry called Answers in Genesis, as you can see on the screen. Some of you may be familiar with the ministry, others may not. We're an apologetics ministry, which doesn't mean we go around apologizing that we're Christians. Rather, it comes from a Greek word, which means to give a, a defense or give an answer. And we try to do that in the area of creation and <coughs> evolution. So we're going to talk about um, the importance of the book of Genesis. And we know it's a controversial issue um, inside the church. So some of you may not take the position that we do, but we're here to try and help, trying to convince, trying to persuade people to see why this issue of the importance of the book of Genesis is relevant and, and is vitally important for us to understand as Christians today. But how many of you would have heard of the ministry in America and a few years ago they opened up the Ark Encounter? Any, any of you, a few of you have heard? I just want to show you, um, because often people are interested in what's going on over there. Um, in 2016, I think it was July 2016, if you've heard of Ken Ham, he's the founder of the ministry in July 2016. They opened up um, what they call the Ark Encounter. It's a full-size um, exhibit of Noah's Ark. I'll just show you a clip and so you can understand a bit more about that. There you go. Only in America, right? It's, <laughs> only the Americans could do that. But when you see that, I've been, had the opportunity to go there a few times, and when you come up and you see the ark, you realize what a massive vessel it was. And so when you have all those questions about how did Noah fit all the animals um, onto the ark, they, they sort of disappear out of your mind because people don't really comprehend how big um, the ark really was. So if you're interested in going, if you're planning a, a holiday to America, you don't go to Disney World anymore. You can go to um, northern Kentucky and um, visit the ark. Anyway, we're going to look at the importance of the relevance of Genesis, what we call the foundation of the gospel, so um, we can understand why this issue of Genesis and um, creation is important. And we try and do that at Answers in Genesis um, in a very particular way by taking people through what we call the seven C's of history there. And you can see them on, on the screen, starting with creation, the fact that God created the world. And when you read Genesis chapter 1, Obviously, this is the controversial issue, but we would say when you read it clearly, whether it's in English or whether it's in the original Hebrew, it's clear that God created in six 24-hour days. And we'll look at that in, in my next session more, more closely. And then the second C is corruption, the fact that Adam, who was a real man, who lived in a real garden, disobeyed God, and according to the Bible, sin and death entered creation. The not a part of the way things work, as with evolution and Charles Darwin's theory, but they're an enemy into God's very good creation. And then in the days of Noah, catastrophe, a catastrophe occurred, a global flood. You know, many people in the church today, because they've been influenced by this idea of evolution and millions of years, would either say the flood in Noah's day was a myth, it never happened, it's just a, a story with a meaning, or it was a local flood somewhere in the region of Mesopotamia. But when you read the text clearly, and you read the New Testament and what Jesus has to say about the flood, it's clearly a global flood. And then at the time of the Tower of Babel, Genesis 10 and 11, you read about the confusion of 
the nations, where God dispersed different people groups um, around the world. We try and avoid using the word races because, according to the Bible, how many races of people are there? One race, right? There aren't multiple races of people. According to the Bible, there's one race, but different people groups. And at Babel, God dispersed different people groups around the world. Then Christ comes into the world, born of a virgin. He dies on the cross to redeem humanity. And we look forward to the consummation of all things in the final sea. You know, many churches in the United Kingdom would believe those last three seas, the Christ, cross, and consummation. They would hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but many in, in the church today reject those first four seas as actual, literal history. But there's a problem. If you do that, if you reject that history in the first four seas, you need to realize that Christ's cross and consummation are founded upon those first four seas. So if you remove that foundation, then you really remove the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we see many people trying to reinterpret or remove the gospel from the church. I want to go through the book of Romans quickly with you, or at least the first section of it. In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17, Paul says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now why he had to tell people he's not ashamed of the gospel? Because there are people in the church who were ashamed of the gospel. And so I hope this morning you are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul goes on to say, For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so Paul, obviously, at the heart of his ministry is the gospel of, of Christ. He wants to persuade people of the good news of the gospel. But if you, if you read on in Romans... You may expect Paul to go on and on and on how glorious the gospel is. And he does eventually get there. But he, before he does that, he goes on to say, not righteousness revealed, but he goes on to talk about the wrath of God as being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You, know, you think, why does he do that? Well, if you've ever been to the doctor's and you go to the doctors and you get a checkup. If there's something wrong with you, before the doctor can say, he, he's the medicine you need to take, you need to know why you need to take the medicine, right? You need to know there's something wrong with you. So before you can understand the good news of the gospel, you need to know the dilemma that you're in as an individual. And so that's what Paul does. He goes on from righteousness to reveal, to wrath reveal, so you can understand the situation that we're in. And Paul goes on to say, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. You know, when you think about what Paul is saying in those few verses, people like Richard Dawkins, when they die and if they don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they won't have an excuse before God because Paul is saying through the Holy Spirit that the revelation of creation is so powerful it gets through. And Richard Dawkins does not have an excuse. He does not have a defense, an apologetic before God, which is what those last few words in Greek mean. He won't have an excuse before God because the witness of creation gets through to him. But Paul's already told you why he doesn't believe. It's not because it's unconvincing. It's because he suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. He pushes down that revelation. But Paul has said there that God's revelation has been evident since the creation of the world. So in other words, man is as old as the rest of creation. God's revelation was there to Adam and Eve in the garden. God's revelation is as old as creation, as old as man is in creation. It's been getting through all the time, but the problem is that people suppress that truth in unrighteousness. And then Paul goes on to tell you the consequences of what happens when people suppress the truth. In Romans 1, 22, 23, and 25, he says this, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. You can see there, that's the language of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And then he goes on to say, because they exchanged the truth, 
about God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So instead of the appropriate response, responding to revelation, God's revelation and creation in a positive way and worshipping the creator, they've suppressed that truth and now they worship creation or the creature. And they do that in a thousand different ways. You just have to look. In reality, when you think about it, we know we, there's, there's many different religions in the world. But in reality, there are only two. There's the worship of the one true living God, or there's worship of anything else. And we see that in the world, and, and it takes place in a thousand different forms. But peop, Paul says people start to worship the creation rather than the creator. And so when you think about Charles Darwin and his book, The Origin of the Species, when he published that in 18. 59. That was what's really going on in his origin of species. He's rejecting God as creator, and he looks to the creation to come up with an answer for existence. He rejects God as the creator of all living things, and he proposed that all of life had come from a common ancestor billions of years ago, when no one is around to see what's going on. All of life is related, as you can see there. We all come from a common ancestor, which is, which is what Darwin's theory was all about, so all of life is related. You know, many people in our culture believe that today, that we're all related, and life goes back to a common ancestor, and they believe in the theory of evolution, and they'll point out and often make a, a fallacy of equivocation, and people do this all the time. They say, I know evolution is true because we see it happening all the time they see a room full of people and just say look at all the different people we have in the room there's many of us here today and we all look very different or if you go out into the world and you look at all the dogs there's so many of them and you see change happening all the time which is true right you do see change happening all the time but change doesn't mean evolution right we believe in natural selection we believe that mutations happening but that doesn't mean Life evolved from a common ancestor. That's the fallacy of equivocation. You know, there are two major problems with that idea of evolution. Because mutations do not add the novel traits necessary for molecules to man evolution. If you're going to go from being a single-celled organism all the way up to man today, you need to add new genetic information. You need new traits. But when you observe what's going on, in the scientific world today, when you study mutations and, and natural selection, you don't see that happening. That doesn't happen. A natural selection does not lead to the changes that given time produce new kinds of animals. You know, because the, the objection from the evolutionists will, will say, well, given enough time, it'll happen. Given enough time. You know, we haven't observed it, but given enough time, it could happen. But the issue isn't about time, it's about the mechanisms. You don't have the mechanisms necessary in order to go from single-celled organisms all the way up to modern man today. You don't observe that in the world we live in. And we illustrate it by talking about evolution's tree of life and what we call creation's orchard, which you can see on the screen. On the, on the picture there on the left is, is common ancestry. But you notice you don't see that in the world today. You don't see that in the fossil record either. When, when you look at the fossil record, animals, the stasis, what we call stasis, they stay the same throughout the fossil record. So even if you believe in the, the millions of years, you don't see change in the fossil record. What you see is what you would expect to see if you believe the Bible. Creation's orchard, that dogs remain dogs, Right? Cats remain. People remain. Yes, there's variation, but you don't go from one kind to another kind. You know, what we read in God's world is what we see in God's world, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. You know, Darwin, in, in his book, he gave the famous example of the finches, and he obviously thought, well, there's variation on the beaks on the finches, which is true, it was a good observation. There was, there was variation on, on the beaks of the fin finches. And then he assumed then that all of life is related. And people still use this answer, this, you know, the beaks finches to say, well, that's proof. 
of evolution. If you've ever heard of Ray Comfort, have you ever heard of Ray Comfort, the Ministry of Living, Living Water as well? Ray Comfort, a few years ago, um, produced this DVD called Evolution Versus God when he went out to, because he's an evangelist, he often goes out into the street, into university campuses in America, and he went to a number of the leading universities in America to interview the students and some of the professors to say, look, I, I believe the Bible, I believe what the Bible says about creation. You don't, you believe in evolution. What's your best evidence of evolution? And so let's, let's just look at what they had to say. You say change of time to mean the evolution of one species from another or to another. Yes, we have that in action actually in the Galapagos. Could you give me one instance? Yeah. We have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. And you take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observable. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kinds. What did the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. So they're still finches? Well, of course they're still finches, yes. Yeah. There's, no there's no change of kind. The little birds that he, uh, that he had observed that... Oh, what did they become? Um, their beaks, their beak shapes. They're, they're still common. birds. Yes, three finches that turn into different types of birds. They're still species. finches. Well, for example, Darwin and, and his study on evolution of uh, the birds on the island that he went on to there. Their beaks changed? Their beaks. Uh, yeah, they're still birds. There's no change of kinds. That's within no, no, the no. kind. Evolution on the beaks. That so that's called adaptation. It's not Darwinian evolution. There's no change of kinds. There's no different animal involved. I want something that shows me Darwin's belief and the change of kinds is scientific. Darwin spoke of a change of kind. See, that's when, when you go out and present the gospel, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to go out because that's what, and we don't mean in that in a mocking way. And in one sense, it can sound ridiculous, the answer they're given, but they're just given the answer they've been taught, the students. And the professors are just repeating what they believe is true. And it does sound silly because, in, in essence, it is silly. Because the, the, beach, the, the, the finch, finch's beaks remain the same. There's no change. It's not evolution at all. But yet people have been drip-fed this for so long that they just assume it to be true. And then they assume we all go back to a common ancestor. See, this is why we need to study these things out to, to, to show ourselves, as the Bible says, approve that we understand these things. But, you know, Darwin understood the importance of this because how many people know what Darwin actually graduated from in, in, in when he graduated university, what his, his degree was in? How many people know? What did he graduate in, do you think? Theology, Theology right? Many people think Darwin went to, 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 to study science at university. Well, he didn't. He went to Cambridge University, and he didn't study science. He studied theology. And why is that important? Well, Darwin understood what the Bible was all about. He'd learned to study the Bible. And so he understood what the Bible said about creation. He understood what the Bible said about the fall. He understood what the Bible said about Jesus' atoning work on the cross. He understood all that. He understood about God's revelation in, in creation. But he also knew what he was trying to disprove and prove in his theory. And he didn't believe that God used evolution to create the world, as many people in our church would today. So the irony of being a theistic evolutionist would be the first person to disagree with you would be Charles Darwin. Because he didn't say God used evolution to create the world. He knew that those two things did not go together, unlike many in our church today. In fact, at the end of his life, um, when he obviously wasn't in the church anymore because he, he did spend some time in a church, someone wrote to him and said, you know, Darwin, Charles Darwin, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about the Bible, Jesus? And he wrote back to them and said this, I'm sorry to have to inform you that I do not believe in the Bible as a divine revelation and therefore not in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You know, this is the whole point of our ministry. We want to point out to people that ideas have consequences and Darwin, once he understood what he was trying to prove in his theory, realized it was not compatible with the Bible. And he rejected it as a revelation. But most importantly, he rejected Jesus Christ as his savior. This is why this issue is important. In fact, 
It's often the secularists, the atheists of the day, who understand the importance of this issue. There's, a, there's an atheist in America called Daniel Dennett, and he has talked about evolution being a universal acid. Now, how many people remember playing with acid when they were in school in the science lab, right? You remember playing with, well, if you're allowed to play with, with acid, but you remember what happens if you get acid and you pour it out. What happens? It goes through things and it corrodes things. And this is Dennett's point. That's what evolution is like. It's like a universal acid. Once you pour it out, it corrodes everything. It's so corrosive that nothing can, can contain it, whether it's your beliefs about God, value, meanness, meaning, purpose, culture, morality. Evolution, he says, corrodes and erodes all those things. And we see the effect of those things in the church and in the culture today. For example, in the Guardian newspaper, just a few years ago, it said this, the number of people who say they have no religion is escalating and significantly outweighs the Christian population in England and Wales, according to new analysis. And they looked at the statistics and they said about 48, nearly half of the population in England and Wales say they have no religion. And it's even worse in Scotland. Scotland is something like 72% of people who'd say they have no religion. And you stand back and think, well, why is that? Well, think about it. For the last 200 years, people have been taught through the school, through the media, through literature, that life is just an accident. There's no purpose, there's no meaning, there's no God. They've been taught the religion, and it is a religion, the religion of naturalism. And then they come out the other end and say, well, yeah, there is no God. And they come out the other end saying, yeah, I'm not religious. When, well, if you understand what the Bible is saying, as Paul's already told us, they are religious, right? Because everyone's religious. There's no such thing as neutrality. There's no such thing as being non-religious. Everyone worships something. That's the whole point of what Paul is saying in Romans 1. People either worship God, the true and living God of creation, or they worship creation. And you need to be able to address people's objections. In fact, Paul goes on in Romans 1, in verses 26 and 27, and a lot of people have problems dealing with this today because Paul goes on to say for this reason this is a consequence of change exchanging what God's revelation is in creation for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions for that women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men con committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. That is a consequence of rejecting the revelation of God in creation. I know many people in the church don't want to talk about this today, but you know what? The Bible talks about these issues, the sin of homosexuality. That's what Paul is talking about here. Once you exchange the truth of God for the lie, and you suppress it and you push it down, you end up committing idolatry, and you end up even doing shameless things, the Bible says. In fact, you see this in our culture today because in 2014, our country didn't legalize gay marriage because there's no such thing as gay marriage. Marriage is defined by the creator as one man and one woman. That's what marriage is. And God defined what marriage is, but they legalized so-called quote-unquote gay marriage in 2014. And, 14, and it's really an example of moral relativism that now pervades the culture in which we live. In fact, remember, if you read the book of Judges, how does it sum things up? In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what? And that's what we see what is happening in the church today. And many people you know, think this is just about being hateful. It's not. This is what happens when you don't trust in God, when you suppress and reject that revelation. In fact, you even see things like this, trans transgenderism, where men seek to become women and women seek to become men. And don't get me wrong, I know people struggle with sexuality. Because we live in a, in, in a fallen, sin-cursed world, there are people who struggle, generally, emotionally, and we understand those problems. But that is not the same as the activism that goes on with the LGBTQ movement. There's a difference there, and you have to know. But this is a serious issue, because it goes back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God made man and woman. He made them male 
and female. And you know what? Scientifically, you're either male or female. You know, there's some people, again, because of the fall and everything, because of sin has consequences, that, that they, they, they have different body parts sometimes. But that is very small percentage of people. It's something like 0.006%. But there are consequences that we're facing today. How many people would have ever thought we would be facing these issues in our culture? But we are. And the only way you can address them is by going back to the text of Scripture, by showing people the truth of what God has done in creation. Because you know who did this? The Savior did this. The Creator. The Bible says Jesus is our Creator. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, and a number of other passages, Jesus is the Creator of all things. And he was asked a question about divorce and remarriage in Matthew 19 by the Pharisees. And listen to how he answered them. Have you not read? There's the authority of the word of God, that he who created them from when? From the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. You know, Jesus recognized the authority of God's word. He recognized the authority of God's word beginning in Genesis when it came to the issue of marriage and, and divorce. He recognized that God had created the male and female. That's so important for us to understand today. In fact, when you think about it, it's not just marriage that's founded upon that history in Genesis being true. It's all biblical doctrine, either directly or indirectly. All of our doctrine in Scripture, directly or indirectly, is founded in that history in Genesis being true. You know, you think about it. Why is there sin and death in the world? It goes back to the book of Genesis, right? Why did Jesus die on a cross? The last Adam goes back to the book of Genesis. Why do we look forward to a new heavens and a new earth? In Revelation, it says the curse will be removed. It goes back to which book? The book of Genesis. You know, why did you all come in wearing clothes today? It's raining outside. It's cold. We need to warm up. Well, if I came back in the summer and it was 35 degrees, you know, maybe one day, luckily, in the summer, could you come in wearing nothing? No, because in the beginning, when you read Genesis, Adam and Eve were naked and without shame. And then they disobey God and they realize they are naked and they have shame. The reason for clothing, even clothing, goes back to the book of Genesis. But we face the same temptation Adam and Eve face. In Genesis 3.1 you read these words. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. You know, you think about what the serpent is trying to do there. He's trying to get Eve to doubt God's word. Because what does doubt often lead to? Doubt often leads to unbelief. And that's the Genesis 3 attack we face today. We, we, we have those doubts regarding God's word. Did God really say he created in six days? Did he really say there was a global flood? Did he really say sin and death came into the world through Adam's disobedience? You know, those are the questions that were being asked in our era of history. We need to realize that the attack on God's word started here, and it's happened ever since throughout the history of the world, but it manifests itself in different ways in different periods of history. For example, if you went to Apostle Paul in, in the first century, and, and you said to Paul, Paul, how did Noah get all those animals on, onto the ark? Or what do you do with cavemen and dinosaurs and ape men and radiocarbon date? And Paul would have looked at you and thought, what are you talking about? Those weren't issues for the Apostle Paul in his days. And if you went to Martin Luther at the time of the Reformation and you said, Luther, same questions. What do you do with them? Weren't issues for Luther in his day, right? He was dealing with justification by faith and sola scriptura and all those other things, which are vitally important. But Luther wasn't dealing with the questions we are dealing with in our age. We need to understand what is the attack on the word of God in our era of history and be able to answer those questions. And we would say, although there's many attacks on scripture, by and large, it's the the, the history of the world that's challenged in scripture through the Big Bang, through naturalistic evolution, um, the origin of man, those are the attacks that we face in, in Scripture today. 
And many people see this issue as, oh, it's the Bible versus science. People would say, oh, Simon, you have the, the, the religious view of the origin of the world. You know, I come in, in a family of many scientists, and they would say, we have the scientific view of the origin of the world. You're religious, we're science, and it's the Bible versus science. And it's not the Bible versus science, because we need to ask this question, what is science? What is science? Because many people get confused about this idea. And if you just look at the definition of science in, in a dictionary, for example, it just says knowledge. And you can have knowledge about God's word, uh, world in many different ways. And Stuart will show you this in, in the next session. But briefly, there's what we call experimental or observational science, which comes from using your five senses in the present to go out and investigate God's world. And that helps you come up with technology such as your laptop, your mobile phone, when you go and visit the doctors for your medicine, so on and so forth. All those different things you see on the screen, those come from what we call operational or observational science, using your five senses in the present to investigate the world we live in. We don't reject that type of science. That type of science is possible, only possible, if God exists and the world is real. And for every real and rational question you answer, there's a real and rational question, right? Those types of questions can only be answered if God exists. And actually, science came out of a Christian worldview. If even atheistic historians would recognize that. But then there's what we call origins or historical science, which is your belief, your belief about the past when you weren't there to see what went on. Because the origin of man, the Big Bang, are questions about the past. How many people were there to see the Big Bang, if you believe in the Big Bang? No one was. Even naturalistic scientists would recognize that. Who was the only person there to see the origin of the world? If you're Christian, the only person that was there was God, who created all things. And what we're saying in his Bible, the revelation to us, he's given us information not all the details, but some of the details to understand what happened at the beginning. But we need to understand there's a difference between those two types of science, about what you can observe in the present and what you believe about the past. And sometimes even evolutionary scientists will admit and recognize this distinction. I want you to listen to this quote um, to one of the leading chemists. He's, he's George Whiteside, from um, a professor at chem chemistry at Harvard University. So he's it's, it's a good school, right? It's, he knows what he's saying. And he's talking about the origin of life here. He said this is one of the big ones in, in science. One of the, one of, this problem is one of the big ones in science. It begins to place life and us in the universe. Most chemists believe, as I do, that life emerged spontaneously from mixtures of molecules in the prebiotic earth. How? I have no idea. On the basis of all the chemistry that I know, it seems to me astonishingly what? Improbable. See, even evolutionary scientists can be honest every now and again. And it's statements like this that actually show you their bias. Because if you realize what he's saying, he's talking about his observational science and his historical science. His observational science says that, that, that what life um, came from a mixture of chemicals spontaneously millions of years ago is, is ru rubbish. My, Science tells me that, but I'm going to believe it anyway. Why? Because I'm an evolutionist, and I need to believe that. That's really what he's saying. He understands the difference, but he doesn't grasp it. And we need to understand that. We need to be teaching our young people about the difference between those two types of science. And we also need to realize it's not a battle over the evidence. You know, people think, you know, if, Simon, if you just give this evolutionist all the evidence for creation, surely he'll be become a, a creationist. And Richard Dawkins is thinking, if you silly creationists just shut up and listen to all the evidence of evolution, then you'll believe in evolution. But we need to realize we all have the same evidence because we all live in the same world. We all have the same fossils, the same stars, the galaxies, the same data methods. The difference is how we interpret that evidence. And you, everyone in the world, we need to realize this, has a bias. There's no such thing as neutrality according to the Bible, right? Paul's already talked, said that there's no bias in Romans 1, but you're either for Christ or you're, you either walk in light or you walk in. There's no such thing as neutrality, even when it comes to these issues. 
You either start with man's word or you start with God's word. And your worldview affects how you interpret evidence. For example, what does that say? Come on, speak up. We've got a debate going on. The atheists versus the Christians. So what does it say? It doesn't say, it says what you want it to say, right? It's a silly example. But you can read it either way. God is now here or God is, is nowhere. This, 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 this is the point. Your bias determines how you interpret evidence. We need to get rid of this idea that there's neutrality in people or interpret things in a neutral way. You don't. Your biases determine how you view evidence. And we would say that when you look at observational science that confirms what the Bible says about you know, kinds changing into the same kinds, you know, people groups being the same, rock layers being laid down very quickly and so on, God's word confirms what we read. So what we, what we see in God's world it confirms what we read in God's world. And we'll, and we'll look quickly at a few things. Creation, we'll look more at this in the next session. But you know, a lot of people struggle with the days of creation. There's all these different theories in the church today of how to understand Genesis 1. The gap theory, you know, you, if you want to believe the world and is very old, you, you say, well, there's a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, and that's where you stuff all this deep time. Or the day-age theory, you know, the, the word in for day in Hebrew, yom, can mean something other than a 24-hour day. And, that, and that's true. That is true. But the question is, what does it mean in its context? And then there's probably the most common position in the church today, theistic evolution, the idea that God used evolution to create. But you know what? None of those positions actually come from the Bible. They all come from people imposing their view of the world onto the Bible, because if you just look at the chronology of the world from the Big Bang perspective versus what the Bible says, then the two very different accounts of the origin of the world. For example, in the evolutionary cosmology, the Earth starts out as a hot molten blob, but in the Bible, the Earth's covered with water for the first two days, right? In the evolutionary cosmology, the stars and the sun come before the Earth, but in the Bible, the Earth is made on day one, and the sun, moon, and stars are made on day four. Very, two very different chronology of Earth history and two de very different starting points for how you understand the world. So it's not like you can just come along and say, well, God used the Big Bang, because if you're saying that, then what God said in his word is different to what he's revealed in the world, right? So it's not like you can just come along and say that, although many people want to. And then there's the issue of corruption. You know, Adam's fall has impacted the world we live in today. You know, many people reject God because they, you've heard this question, what's the most common objection to Christianity? Why is there all the suffering in the world, right? Every person you meet in the street will say, if there is a God, why does he allow all the suffering in the world? Because they've been taught through the school system that death and suffering has always been a part of the world, you know, and you have to deal with those questions if you're going to talk to people about God. But the Bible tells us in Genesis 2, 16 to 17, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall what? Surely die. In other words, in the Hebrew, it literally reads, die in, you shall die. In other words, death would come in as a consequence of Adam's disobedience. And that's not just talking about spiritual death. It's talking about both spiritual separation from God and physical death, because in Genesis 3, 17 to 19, you read this, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Adam was made from the dust of the ground in Scripture, and he goes back to the dust. He didn't go back to being some ape-like creature when he died. He went back to the dust of the ground. This is what you read in, in God's word, really, that man's actions brought sin and death into the world. So the way we can answer those questions is that sin and death that we see in the world today are not God's fault, they're a consequence of man's actions. In fact, when you get further on in Romans, Paul tells us this, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And in context, Paul is talking about human death but he says, Adam brought that death into the world. But he goes on 
continues to go on in, in Romans 8 because he talks about the fact that creation one day is going to be redeemed. But he says this before that, for we know that the whole world groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. The whole world was affected by Adam's sin. So when you see things like earthquakes, tsunamis, and, and so on, those have been just part and parcel of the world in Charles Darwin's theory. But in the Bible, they're a consequence of Adam's sin. In fact, think about this picture of Adam and Eve in the garden. Oh, Adam, this is such a perfect world. And Adam responds, yes, Eve, it's very good, just like God said, when if you believe in evolution millions of years, then the problem is that you've got all that death and suffering under the fossil record and underneath Adam and Eve, which says, actually, it's, it's not very good because death and suffering isn't very good. In fact, when you read in Genesis 1, it tells you a bit about the original creation because it tells us that originally man and the animals were vegetarian to begin with. They were eating um, the fruit and the plants for food, man and the animals. It was there was no kill or be killed. There was no carnivorous activity. In fact, in the fossil record, even evolutionary scientists would tell you there's, there's brain tumor, there's cancers in, in, in found in dinosaur bones that have been dated to be millions of years old, although we would disagree with the, the suppositions that are read into those, that are found in those bones. But think about it. How did God sum up creation? How, what did he say? He didn't say it was good. He said it was very good. Now think about that. Is God looking at a world full of cancer, brain tumors, and saying, behold, this is all very good? If you believe God used evolution, then re really, that's what you have to say. Have you ever seen someone suffer from cancer or a brain tumor? And what do you say? Behold, what you're going through is very good. You know that's not true. But that would be the consequence if you did believe God used evolution. In fact, there are scientists who even find, find fossil forms in the fossil record, which they date to be millions of years old. But Genesis 3.18 tells us, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Again, Adam's sin affected the entire creation. You know, those two ideas of millions of years of death and suffering lead into man's existence, and the Bible's view of man's sin bringing death into the world are two very different ways of looking at the world. Two very, very different ways. And... There are Christians who say, oh, you can try and put them together. We would disagree with that. But again, I said at the beginning, the secularists and the atheists of the day actually recognize the problems with doing that better than some of our Christian theologians and scholars. I want you to listen to a clip of um, a scientist, an evolutionary scientist, talking um, to someone. And this was on the BBC a number of years ago. It was to do with, with creation and evolution. And, and his name is Jerry Coyne. Listen very carefully to what he says about the theory of evolution. Evolution is unique amongst the sciences because it strikes people in the solar plexus of their faith directly. It strikes them in the idea that they're specially created by God because evolution says you're not. It says that um, there's no special purpose for your life because it's a naturalistic philosophy. We have no more extrinsic purpose than a squirrel or an armadillo. And it says that morality does not come from God. It is an evolved phenomenon. And those are three things that are really hard for humans to accept, particularly if they've been brought up in a religious tradition. There's an, an evolutionist telling you basically what evolution is all about. You're not specially created by God, right? Which is what the Bible tells you, because it says evolution is just a naturalistic philosophy. There's no purpose to life, you know, there's no intrinsic value. Now, he said you have no more value than an armadillo. Wow. It's amazing how, you know, these people live on. You have no more value than a squirrel or an armadillo. And he says morality is an evolved phenomena. So there's no such thing as absolute morality. But you know, a lot of the times, some of these evolutionists want to say, that's immoral. You Christians are immoral people. But he just said evolution doesn't account for morality. But do you see? That's a consistent view of the evolution of the world. But you think about it. We'll quickly move on. If there was no death before sin, then how do you explain the fossil record? How do you explain the fossil record from a biblical perspective if there was no death 
before sin. Well, we would say the catastrophe, the flood in the days of Noah would account for the vast majority, not all of it, because there was some things after the flood, but the flood would account for the fossil record. You know, the problem today with this issue is that we teach in the church, we teach the story of a flood as a story, right? You see that picture of, a, of, of the ark, a bathtub ark, with all the animals sticking its necks out the side, and it would never survive a global flood. But be honest, when we teach the, the account of the flood, and we need to drop that word story, because what does the word story convey to people in our era of history? Fiction, right? Not true. We can say that, right? You know what it means. It means not true. So that's why we need to stop using that word, because you convey to the children... Uh, it's not true. This is just a story. And then they'll go to the school system, watch Attenborough on TV, and, and, and learn the real history of the world. But the reason people believe that the, 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 the world is millions of years old is because they believe the fossil record, those layers have been down, laid down slowly over millions of years. In fact, that's the, the picture I was talking about. But you know when you see that, when children see that, they'll just say, yeah, that's a myth. That is not true when we saw at the beginning, that is in fact the size of the ark. The ark was a real, the flood was a real account of God's not only judgment, but salvation. In fact, Jesus confirms the account of the flood because in, in Luke 17, in another passage in Matthew's Gospel, he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and what? destroyed them all. In other words, people were just getting on with life, doing what's normal, eating and drinking, marrying, life was going on. They weren't acknowledging God. And obviously you have to read these words in light of Genesis 6 where it tells you God judged the world because of its wickedness. But Jesus says the flood came and destroyed them all. So it can't be a local flood because Jesus is also saying this is an example or an analogy of the end judgment that's to come, which is a global judgment, right? Right? So you couldn't use a, a myth or a local flood as an analogy for a real event that's going to take place in the future, a global judgment. Jesus clearly believed in the account of the flood. And if that was Jesus' view of the flood, if we're his followers, his people, then we need to have the same view as our saviour. But think about it, if there was a global flood, what would you expect to find? Well, if you've ever heard Ken Ham, he says, billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the world. And you know what happens when you go out and look into the world? When you look at Grand Canyon, what do you see? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. The flood left its mark. People say, where's all the evidence for the flood? Well, it's staring you right in the face. The, the reason people reject it is because of their worldview. Because an evolutionist stands back at the Grand Canyon and says, the canyon was formed by a long bit of time and a little bit of water, the Colorado River running through the middle of Grand Canyon. And that makes no sense when you think about it. But a better interpretation of the canyon would be a lot of water and a little bit of time. See, there's, there's a different interpretation. And you know what? We find evidence today that fits with that interpretation and that doesn't fit with the evolutionary approach because how many of you can remember when Mount St. Helens blew up, right? May 18th, 1980. I was only one at the time, so I can't remember that. But it left its mark. Thousands of individual little uh, layers of, of, of rock layers there that were laid down in a matter of hours. You know, those 20 feet of finely laminated layers of rock laid down in a matter of hours. It didn't take millions of years to lay those things down. In fact, as an eruption that took place two years after the initial one, and it formed what they call Engineer's Canyon. That was another massive eruption. That canyon is 120 feet deep, and it took nine hours to form that canyon. And guess what? What do you see in the middle? There's a little river running through the canyon. And guess what? That little river did not cause that canyon to form. It took a catastrophe. Right? It took a catastrophe. It didn't take time, it took a process. And that's what we need to understand. It didn't take time, it took a process. But let's, let's sum it all up. You know, he's a, he's a house with a crack and in, in its foundations. Now, 
Some of the, the married ladies in the audience all, all, all know this example because ladies, if, if you ever have a, a crack in, in your living room wall and you say to your husband, husband, you know, go and fix that crack. You know, what does the husband generally do? He, he, gets, he gets the paint in and, and puts it over the crack or he gets the polyfiller and tries to fill in the crack. And what happens? Your house falls down and you kick your husband out of it, right? No, you don't do that. But that's what will happen. If you don't deal with that crack that's in the foundations properly, because if you've got a crack in your living room wall, where's the problem? It's in the foundations, right? And if you don't deal with that problem correctly, your house falls down. And that's what we see in our culture. That's what we see in the church today because people have, and God's people have given up that foundation. We see the collapse in the church today. We see the consequences of when you give up the foundations of God's word. This is why it's so important to hold to the truth of God's world because it's also a gospel issue. Now, what I don't mean by that is that you cannot be a Christian unless you believe what I believe about creation. That's not what we're saying. Do not get that idea. That's not what we're saying. We've never said that. You can be a Christian and believe that God used evolution. You can be a Christian and believe in an old earth. It won't make you a consistent Christian, but you can be a Christian. Because the Bible says if you can confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, he raised him from the dead. That's a supernatural event, by the way then you'll be saved. But the Bible tells us, Paul tells us in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. Do you realize at one time you were in Adam, if you're a Christian? And only by God's grace are you in Christ. Do you realize every person out there in the world who's, who's not a Christian is in Adam? and is in need of their saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you, if you reject a historical Adam, as many in the church are doing today, there's numerous books out there that will do that, you can find. Then what that means is people out, out there aren't in Adam. So who are they in? And therefore you do lose the gospel. This is a gospel issue because it's founded in the gospel. As Phil said, there's numerous books at the back that will help you, because you won't remember everything I've said. I've, I wrote a book, I think last year it came out, Adam the First and the Last, Responding to Modern Attacks on um, Adam and Christ. And that will deal with some of the issues we've dealt with today, but show you what's going on in the church. There's another great book at the back. If you've got children or young people, then this is the book to get, Glass House, Shattering the Myth of Evolution. That will deal with all the common examples or arguments that evolutionists use today and it will destroy them. And then we've got what we call our answers books, one, two, three, and four. And those deal with the most common questions you get in the de um, today with all the issues of distant starlight, how, how do you, you know, date things, ape men, ancestors, and all those things, dinosaurs, which we're dealing with tomorrow night, are answered in those books. And Neil, is it two for ten? There's a number of DVDs out the back there on different topics and when we come out until we make our DVDs two for ten pound and then we've got numerous pocket guides on different issues um, to do with the Bible and science and um, they're great to either get into the hands of young people or, or even use for, for witnessing those are two pound each and if you want to um, pray for us then we have a newsletter at the back that you can sign up for.